the kind of thing that happens. Uh, it happens in Catalonia as well. Um, and he founded this social project from scratch. Uh, he started from his own home, and then it grew and grew over the past 20 years. It uh, had support from FIFA, uh, from Ministries of Foreign Affairs, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, they're very pleased to receive this prestigious support from UFEC, ITTI, and the government of Catalonia. What does, uh, the, what does caramba mean? Well, I don't know if you know Portuguese, but it, the phrase comes from the phrase caramba, caramba, which is an expression of surprise. It's something you say when you're surprised, like, gee, gee whiz. <laughs> and that was what he experienced when he saw these neighborhoods in in uh, uh, Brazil and he discovered what was there. It started out in Copacabana. Currently, the project is supporting more than a thousand children. It's particularly emphasized women's football recently. Uh, you know, there's you know a coach, a woman coach. Uh, so the staff includes women too, and uh, the admin staff as well, or the leadership staff. There's also the Cinderella project. Was not that was not included in this video. Uh, so people will go to the to a, a neighborhood school in the neighborhood of Samosalo. It would be something like Samboy de Llobregat, anyway. You know, a small nearby nearby town. And the pro the project was presented there. Every girl there was given one football shoe and told if you want the other shoe you have to come and collect it and play and most of them went i mean when i saw that video i was in tears i really recommend watching it another important point when there are donations some of the resources received are allocated to admin costs and the like. Caramba has managed to allocate 95% of donated funds to what participants actually receive. So, in other words, there is a very tiny percentage allocated to work that doesn't actually directly reach the target population. The girls, the players, are very happy, as you were able to see, not only for the support received. At this age, any kind of support can really transform your life. They're also very pleased to be visible in a place such as this one on a day like today. Ultimately, today we're talking about values and education here as we saw in the preceding panel. One possibility is this. It gets, for, for the Caramba participants, uh, taking part in this project is a dream. Well, one requirement to, to be part of Caramba is school attendance. So the value of education is brought on board as well. So Caramba is supporting a lot of values. And the aim is not to create the latest stars in the world of football. Some of the children actually make it to professional football. There's one woman, well, one girl player who seems to be really good and they want her in a lot of places. If there's, a, if there's any scout around here, really, this is an opportunity. I have to say it. And since we're talking about women in sports, I, have, I, I figured I'd, I'd just let you know. But that's not the ultimate aim. Very few people in sports actually become professionals and, and turn the sport into their life. The main point is for these people to obtain an education, to achieve integration as well. The project also works on integration at every level. 
And so both boys and girls can end up working as coaches and that actually matters much more than having one or two players becoming football stars. The panelists today have been through uh, what these girls want to achieve. I mean think of it all as a process I, as I told you, I'm not part of the project, per se. I just try to support them and uh, help them spread the word and so forth. How did I get here? Well, I started talking to Adri a few years ago, and sometimes something big can come out of something small. Even if you're just doing your little bit, that can lead to something big. So. I'd like to encourage you all to follow Caramba, to get to know Caramba. Uh, the website is www.caramba.pr and, and then, you know, follow it on Instagram and so on and so forth. Even if you like, follow, slash, whatever, well, that's a, even that is something. And if you want to contribute, that would also be good. And I'm happy to answer any questions and anything you can contribute can actually transform a life and if you actually travel to Brazil you can experience the project per first hand if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your words Stefano. We will continue now with the second round table called Sports Does Gender Matter and uh, we're going to speak about sex and gender in sports competitions the rights uh, uh, in sports law which is something that i very i feel very passionate about as a sports lawyer and uh, some of the latest news about this so i invite isabel perez who's a general manager of uh, the union of sports federation as well as marta autor who's the euroleague general council advisor Alexandra Gomez, who's a legal advisor at FIPRO. Natalie St. Cyr Clark, former legal affairs manager at FIBA. Y Ana Almesija, a member of the Women in Sport Professional Sports Association. Y por último, a la moderadora y periodista Begoña Villarrubia. Thank you and welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Does gender matter? Uh, gender is extremely important in the in the world of sports, which is why we have these uh, top speakers with us. I'm going to introduce them one by one. Isabel Perez, who's the general manager at the Union of Sports Federation Catalonia. Does gender matter in sports? Microphone, please. Unfortunately, we cannot translate without a microphone, please. Sorry. I thought I had a lapel mic on, but you're right, I don't. Um, it's quite impressive to be up here, mind you. Thank you all for coming. And uh, uh, people who are a bit further away could maybe come closer. Pilar, Ingrid, there are some empty seats. I think it would be better if you move closer to where we are. But let me try to reply this. This is the easy round table, mind you. Uh, yes, uh, gender is extremely important in sports. Why? Because originally, as we know, sports was were designed um, by men, uh, for men, following their own models. And when people started uh, asking for women to be there, there was a, a, a division by gender, a binary division, and uh, the level of testosterone was selected as a biomarker, uh, which is, I'm sure, what we will all be discussing about because this biomarker is imperfect. And if you're a scientist, you will know this better than I do. But there's somewhat of a consensus. Society moved on. There was this binary division. However, we all made headway 
and there were some people and some new groups who mm, were asking to be active in the field of sports and obviously just like it happens with uh, transgender people and the regulation for everything that they have to go through uh, well new solutions um, had to be given there are 17 uh, laws in Spain to fight against uh, trans discrimination there's also a bill being discussed at the moment and the debate is uh, should the, the world of sports adapt to the regulation or the other way around should we change the law uh, so that it reflects reality and we are here in a women in sports uh, congress and i think that the kind of uh, safe environment that women achieved in the field of sports should not be endangered and in order to finish uh, uh, with an answer that is very lawyer-like, well, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, we need to really pay attention to the specific case. Rugby, uh, fencing, uh, swimming, football, they're completely different. Or if a person has transitioned when they were 10 or when they are 30 after having been intensely trained. Uh, it is really necessary to focus on uh, every single case. The Union of Federations, and I'm sure that that's something we've been working on uh, with some of you, the Department of Equal Opportunities from the Catalan government um, contacted us uh, to talk about that, how to integrate people who were transitioning. and. We're always generous when we're asked uh, to be part of committees. We just said, okay, let's take a sample. Uh, we should have a federation of a team sport, an individual sport, and uh, another federation that is more uh, male-oriented, another one that is more female-oriented. This has been going on for two years, and we still don't have a general rule um, uh, with the help of the administration so that it can be taken on as a, a rule to be enforced in all different sports federations. So uh, I think that sex and gender are extremely important in sports. And so far, uh, based on the science that we know of, uh, we need to treat every case differently. Okay, thank you. There are a lot of challenges, and uh, gender is extremely important, especially in international competitions. So we'll move to uh, Marta Udor, who's the general counsel advisor. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Is gender important in sports? Well, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for um, holding this inspiring Congress, hopefully the first of many. Now, if you allow me, I'll apply a legal lens to this question. I hope it's not too boring. Now, uh, is gender important from a legal point of view? The answer should necessarily be, uh, well, it shouldn't. It shouldn't matter because we have a regulation, we have legislation for uh, uh, gender equality that uh, well, uh, is aims to achieve this kind of equality in all fields. However, in in the specific area of sports, there are many different categories uh, when competing between men and women. So, if we open up the debate, I think this this is the right forum to ask ourselves: Is it reasonable? to separate by category, female, male and female, in sports. I think it's an interesting question, because as I was saying, the current uh, legislation, or if we take a look at some gender-based pieces of legislation uh, from our uh, environment, there shouldn't be a distinction by category based on conditions that are legally protected, even from our constitution in Spain and in many European countries. So, on that basis, and I'm sure that there will be other interesting ideas um, banded about later during the discussion, but you asked me a question and I'll probably answer with another question. Is it possible? to um, determine different categories mm, on the basis of objective criteria or features that can be 
equated regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, uh, sexual orientation, religion. These are categories that are uh, legally protected. Now, could can we hold a sports uh, competition based on objective criteria such as height, age, um, the sports performance of the athlete, the results, this would mean a change in the system and the way that we've known sports competitions all along, but this is the right place to ask these kind of questions. Okay, thank you, Marta. I'll give the floor to Alexandra Gomez, a FIFRO a legal advisor. So, same question for you. Does gender matter? I'll speak in Spanish. I'll try. Because I was talking to Marta and in the office uh, we tend to speak about this uh, topic in English. I, I work in the Netherlands and it's an international environment and I probably know the terminology uh, in English rather than Spanish. But I have to say it's a very tough question. And it was changed because you started speaking about sex and then you moved to gender and they're completely different things. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel the same. Okay, so I believe that gender is more important and it matters more than sex. Why? Because if we speak about gender, that's how you identify yourself. So, bearing in mind human rights, I think we should um, give uh, or attach more significance to gender rather than the sex you're born with. However, Mm, our, the answer is not as simple, obviously, because we need to apply that to um, sports. And it, it may have an, a role there. The reality is that it hasn't been tested. We don't have a lot of studies to prove this, specifically regarding football, which is uh, the sports where I have uh, most experience, because we're talking about 11 uh, players on each side and it hasn't yet been shown uh, how it would change if some of those athletes uh, were transgender for instance so uh, before we answer the question I think that we should try to understand more about this topic to educate ourselves uh, its consequences and to to do some research because there are a lot of uh, preconceptions that we carry around uh, pre-established ideas that we keep repeating over and over and we take them to be true for instance um, the higher your testosterone level the better athlete you will be or the better you will perform that is not true or not always true it's not a linear relation so we should uh, research this further and also to focus on the athlete as a human being in his or her particular sports because it may be more important in some disciplines than others and we should not regulate trans athlete or intersex athletes as a category because all of them cisgender intersex transgender all of them we're all different right so among um, male or female transgender uh, athletes, there are a lot of differences as well. So we should be extremely careful, uh, to my mind, when uh, applying um, constraints. If I focus on FIFPRO, uh, this is something that is still being discussed. We don't have an official position about it. But I wanted to, to tell you that we are currently um, holding uh, constant talks with FIFA about it because uh, FIFA is uh, well, attempts to regulate this issue in, in a more modern fashion and aligning it to well what's what's the term the International uh, Olympic Committee uh, yes so aligning itself with IOC uh, because the uh, regulation that is currently in place in FIFA is from 2011. It's quite restrictive and quite vague. Uh, it is not explicit what kind of athlete it refers to, which is why we're working on that point. Okay.
Thank you. So transgender athletes uh, sometimes have been a controversial issue and you're true that there are laws and, and regulations that need to be applied and both the IOC and other institutions, international institutions are analyzing this. We have uh, Marije, uh, Marije Floren, uh, president of Eurohockey. Uh, does gender matters in your, in your experience? Yeah, um, yes, of course it does. Um, and then indeed it's the difference, what you already said, between if it's sex or gender, uh, but both differs. But I approach it from a different point of view than my fellow uh, speakers, um, because uh, I have to lead an organization where we play sport. And if you play sport, in our sport it's also 11 to 11, then it's about that it is a competitive sport. So that in a way uh, you, you organize the competition in that way that the, the strength in the different competition is more or less the same. Because if every match is 30-0 then nobody has fun. And fun, joy, is a very important aspect from sport, I think. So, in, in our sport, it's at the moment that we can say worldwide it is 50-50 men and women. Uh, it was happening in Tokyo and next time in France for sure that all participants will be uh, the same. I would say the numbers would be the same, 5,000, 5,000, because the maximum is 10,000 uh, players, all sports. In hockey, actually, it's from we used to be already playing together. But what was not was the case is that the umpiring was the same, the coaching the same, the leadership was not the same. Just when I became president of the European Hockey Federation, um, first of all, of course, you start to get used to your position because I was in Europe the only women uh, president from the Olympic sports. Um, and secondly, you are thinking, what are my goals uh, in the coming years? And one of the aspects for me from leadership is that I don't decide what, is, what are my goals, but that my members and my clubs determine. So I can bring forward, hey, do you see what I can see? That we are in players' participation, we are the same, but we see in all uh, accompanying things, empires, officials, uh, uh, staff, it's not the same. Take, for example, uh, the World Cup in Terrassa uh, two months ago. Big success, uh, 16 teams competing, women teams from all over the world, but only two teams had women coaches. That means that 14 teams were coached by men uh, coaches. Nothing against men, of course, but you can think what's strange that if you have 16 teams uh, with so talentful uh, players, Georgina was one of them, um, strange that there are not enough uh, uh, women coaches to compete. Um, empires we have regulated now. We started in Europe at a certain moment to say if we have women matches at a high level, then there need to be women empires. And actually I was doubting if we could achieve it, but to my surprise in four years time we had already a kind of an army of uh, good women empires and they are growing every day. So that is working. Officials is the same. But what is not the same is in the leadership. We really try to change that there are more women leaders coming up. And that's why I was so uh, happy to listen to, the, um, to all the athletes in the, the, the last panel, that they all had so clear opinion about what is the future, what, what we need to change, because they have got the uh, uh, opportunity to compete at a high level, and I hope they will make the step to stand up. So, in a summary, for me, uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, approaching it from a legal point of view, however, I'm a lawyer, but I'm trying to uh, um, approach it from the competition point of view, and maybe in my next turn I can explain a little bit how we did it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. La importancia de las nuevas generaciones. Thank you. Yes, the importance of new generations and their view about the future. Thank you so much. And now we move to Anna Mechtica uh, from the International Sports Association. Anna will tell us about protocol and uh, security in uh, the org event organization. What are the challenges that are being faced? Hello. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for having invited me. We will speak about dreams. For me, it is a dream to speak about gender-based security in, in this forum. I'm a member of the uh, Association of Women in Professional Sports. Uh, the uh, Catalan chapter will be presenting tomorrow. And this association helped me uh, make this dream come true to, to work on security from a gender perspective with uh, gender uh, violence prevention plans to work on um, equal opportunities plans. And as you know, we uh, now have to also protect uh, minors. It is our obligations. In the past, we would do it because we thought it was the right thing to do, but now th there's a legal obligation. So it's very important to let people know that gender is extremely important. So when we talk about safety and security, they're completely different things if we need to protect men or women. In the in this uh, world of, uh, of uh, security, there are not that many women. So I encourage you as federations to also hire women for safety and security purposes. Uh, having this equality, gender equality, is indispensable, but it, it's it's not um, the only thing that matters. We all need to change our mindset and to understand that this gender perspective should be mainstreamed across our institutions. Sometimes I take a look at documents that people write. Yesterday I was reading a protocol uh, that is being drafted against uh, gender violence from an institution. Um, I'm not going to name them. And they were speaking about values. They said, we're all athletes, therefore we all share the same values. And the only code of conduct is to respect one another. These are empty words. I, I encourage you to, to include real content uh, on our document. We are fed up of seeing so many uh, documents that have been uh, copycat from other institutions and they should be adapted to our own situation. If we really want to protect our female athletes and gender perspective protects everyone, not only women, it protects all of us, we also should take into uh, seriously what this gender perspective means. We need to come up with the right protocols um, suited for our own uh, facilities, our own kind of competitions when we, when we uh, travel and go to, to our tournaments. We need to understand what kind of measures need to be implemented and to really believe in them, not just because the law says so. If there's a, a new policy on child protection, uh, we shouldn't all of us be doing the same thing. We should be specializing in what we do and taking seriously uh, this kind of responsibility. I was a lawyer for some years and then I changed uh, and started working on safety and security. And uh, I think it's very important to have people professionally trained. These kind of protocols are not something that we can outlive overnight. Please have professionals by your side. They can be criminologists or uh, security um, managers, we can help you and write the right documents for you. And I'm uh, lucky enough to be part of this uh, association of uh, professional um, female athletes. And they've been serious, seriously working on this for years. So if you have any doubt or question, we are here to help you. That's great. Thank you. We also have with us uh, Nathalie Son Sinclair, who is a member of the Legal Affairs um, Management at FIBA. Like uh, the rest of the um, people, uh, does gender match up? Um, I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, for transparency purposes, I've recently left FIBA, so I'm not working there anymore. Um, but I think for me, the three things that gender matter or sex matters in have been touched on by the other ladies. So I would say firstly, yes, the interplay between sex and gender is very important and I'll talk a little bit about um, the challenges that FIBA faced when we tried to establish a policy on that. Secondly, people who are women or identify as women and are participating in a category in sport that is for women, um, what are the particular challenges that they face because quite frankly it's not the same as the challenge